So uh, sure. as, as far as the background, real quickly, uh, uh, you know, the, we, we started this project uh, in August, and, and the intent was actually to be done about now. So, uh, Bruce, you may have to weigh in on this. Uh, you know, do we try to finish at the end of September or, you know, make some adjustment? But I, I know we had a couple of weeks where we, we, we couldn't get everyone together. But uh, Liza and Zuhan have been, been uh, going ahead and, and doing the, the model runs for the other uh, scenario, scenarios. Uh, I don't know how far along you are uh, this week, Liza. We haven't talked about it. Uh, are you over halfway now? Yeah, yeah actually, no, we're, we're complete with all model runs at this point. So yeah, I, I, and and doing validation and all that kind of stuff. So, so Bruce, I think we're in pretty good shape there. Uh, you know, presenting the results. Hopefully, hopefully, this is kind of what you're looking for. Well, there's uh, two so. things, Rob. I was looking for one is I wanted to present the results, and two, I wanted to make sure that when we presented the results, the states had enough information that they could feel that they could run it for themselves and understand the outputs. So that, that second one is actually more important to me than, you know, you just, okay, we ran the results. I need to make sure that people understood what happened and could, could use the model or understand its implications. Yeah, I'd like to be able to reproduce your, your work on my own so that or maybe Hong could reproduce the work on her own so that if we needed to do another run for some other purpose, we would feel confident um, making use of the model ourselves. Laura, a non-flood event. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think Liza's going to get into a lot of that, but may, maybe not, maybe not full-blown that we would have for the whole group. So... Well, what I did is I rec I'm recording the audio and the video, and I will make that available back to the people on this call. I mean, I'll edit out some of the stuff. <laughs> I'll make it available to them and say, hey, okay, you know, how did this, you know, kind of a mid-project, how did this do for your training, and, and do you think it helped things of that nature? So Liza, uh, who is actually on PTO, uh, uh, was interrupting her PTO to, to do this. So, Liza, you want to uh, walk walk through the the, the modeling and results yes. at this point? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, and we we um, proceeded with scenario three for um, this webinar, which is um, the scenario for Louisiana, the the flooding scenarios. So there's three main topics to this um, webinar. The first is the project background, defining scenario three. Um, then we'll go into modeling, how it was modeled and, and what settings were used. And finally, we'll, we'll conclude with the results. So a brief overview of this scenario is that um, it's, the closure of I-20 in the vicinity of Bossier City, as well as I-10 in the vicinity of the Sabine River. And we did, even though this is, we're calling it Scenario 3, it actually has three sub-scenarios. So A, 3A, we looked at just closing the closure of I-20 and those impacts. 3B was just the closure of I-10. And then C, 3C was the closure of I-20 and I-10 at a specific location. And ultimately, the purpose is to look at the, you know, larger regional distributions of traffic on the interstates and how parallel facilities are impacted. So the first thing was to define the exact limits. And um, we did that for both the I-20 closure and the I-10 closure, um, where I-20 is from Ada to State Road 157, um, going westbound, eastbound, I-20 is closed from I-220 to Ada. Similarly, we did that for I-10, um, where it's closed from 
LA 109 through the Sabine River going westbound, and then from um, should that be Texas? Yeah. I don't know if that crosses. Yeah, that does cross the state line. Texas now, 62. Those points, did, who determined those points? Y'all did, or Louisiana provided that information? These were um, confirmed. We provided. Laura, them. yeah, Louisiana I think were confirmed. Okay, so once once we have an understanding of the project and you know the intention of it, we can go ahead and start the modeling. And we access the model um, that was developed as of January of this year, and that's um, developed for the TransCAD 6 Release 2 software, um, specifically build 9085. It one thing to note is there is a release of TransCAD 7, but models are not, or I should say geographic files are not forwards compatible with TransCAD 7. So if you open the highway network or TAZ file in TransCAD 7, it cannot be reopened back in TransCAD 6. So that's kind of a little, um, side note to be aware of. And then um, the model contains kind of three separate interfaces, one for a scenario manager, one for running the model, and then a third one for reporting utilities and map development. And all of this is referenced in the model documentation. Um, the, the model document delivered in January includes appendices for a user's guide as well as an appendix for practice scenarios. And I strongly encourage um, those to be referenced for installing the model and um, operating the various interface components. Um, I'm more than happy to go through all of that, but I know we've we've kind of touched on that in the past, and I didn't want to rehash it all. Um, but but those are great references for getting started. So this slide lists the main steps that are needed for this scenario. Um, the first is, well, we've identified the project description. Um, now we need to go a little bit deeper and make sure we understand the attributes for the project links. And these, the, there are three main attributes, area type, number of lanes, and functional class. Um, so those, those three attributes are inputs for every single link in the shift model. Uh, can you see that again? It's area type, area type, either urban or rural. Right. Number of lanes and functional class. Okay. And the functional class is defined um, in the model documentation, but it's basically interstate freeways, principal arterials, minor arterials, and collectors. Right. Um, And then um, also part of step one is defining the termini within TransCAT or within the, sh the shift model network. Um, as we know, the model network doesn't include every road. Um, this model is developed really for the arterial and higher roadway facilities. Um, so the geography and alignment as well as the access points um, for the project need to be identified in the shift network. The next step is to input project IDs. Um, and so step two is there's a project, a master project list that is um, an input file under the master folder 
where it houses um, you know, all the, pro the future year projects. And currently, the project list that was delivered with the model are just those existing plus committed projects. Um, so I recommend for any scenario run is to create a copy of that project list file and append a new record for the new scenario, um, which I can go to through in a little bit more detail in a minute. But um, basically you would add a new record for scenario 3A. You know, the project ID could be 3A, and then the attributes for area type, lanes, and functional class would be entered. The third step is to, for that project ID that was added to the project list, you would then need to make sure that's entered into the master network for those links identified for the project. Um, and that may require splitting of links so that the project matches the described termini, um, as well as making some, some geographic alignment checks. And for this scenario, that's, that's really the, the heart of it, is entering in project IDs um, into the project list and into the master network. Um, this is just really an attribute change um, for a closure of a road. And instead of it being a, maybe like a four-lane facility, it goes for that section, it goes to a zero-lane facility. Step four involves light validation of the project study area. Um, so once you know the, the project IDs are entered, it's a good idea to double check the sensory connectors and um, access points to the project. For example, um, you know the, the, the zones are, are relatively large, so you wouldn't you wouldn't want a sensory connector to be in the middle of this project, um, you know, where the lanes are closed and it wouldn't allow for vehicles to basically access the interstate. Um, you would want to add sensory connectors to other facilities um, that could provide access to the highway network. And this would again be done in the master network so that um, it's carried through when you run the no build scenario versus um, the build scenario. So you have you know, an apples to apples comparison. So after a light validation, then you are ready to create the scenario in the um, user interface and run this scenario. I'd like to ask something, and mm -hmm. it reveals my ignorance about these things. But we're not building anything. Why is it called a build scenario? Um, it's more of a terminology. Oh, okay. Um, that just means build scenario will be the scenario where a section is shut down? Yes. <clears throat> So yes, or maybe I should have called it the shutdown yes. scenario. <laughs> hey, Liza, this is Virginia. What you might want to, Laura, what you might want to think about it. Yeah, that is terminology that's used in modeling all the time. Typically, your no-build scenario for whatever year it is, either base year, future year, means yeah. it's yeah. the no-build. It's the status. It's the status quo. It's, yeah, I understand no-build, yeah. but I just right. Knew that and then the build is basically oh. the change. Okay. What the whatever it is you're testing. Quo and the change. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should, could call them like 2040 existing and then 2040 modified. Um, no, just so as long as I understand what you mean by it, that's all. I was like, we're not building any yeah. roads. What is this? No. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those reality checks. So I, thank I you. I guess you're building new centroid connectors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Um, yeah, so think of, think of 
anywhere where it says build scenario, think of that as, as the, the project okay. scenario. As is. Status quo. Um, um, yeah, no, well, the no build is the as is. I have a question. If we yes. only run it for 2040, and then uh, how can we uh, validate the model if we don't run it for the uh, existing? Yes, so the, the well, validation is, is a, um, can mean several things. Um, you know, if you're talking existing conditions um, compared to observed traffic count validation, then yes, that would need to be evaluated um, in the base year, mm -hmm. which I, th I think for this one it's 2014, maybe 2015. Sorry, I can't remember offhand. Um, the, the, the validation in particular for, for these scenarios is um, making sure that there's appropriate access and um, that ultimately the model will be sensitive to the change. So it will be sensitive to uh, compare or to be able to provide a reasonable comparison between the no build or the 2040 existing compared to the build or the project scenario. So the, in this case, the light validation, just making sure that all the uh, traffic can be rerouted if it's uh, if the 1020 shut down. Correct, correct. It's it. We ensured that as well as after the models run, we ensured that the volumes made sense. Um, you know, because sometimes maybe you did. You know, the the coder didn't code in attributes correctly, or you know, the, there could be some sort of connectivity issue where roads look like they intersect but didn't actually intersect. Okay. Um, so we're gonna uh, make sure that before and after shutdown, the traffic, I mean, the volume on the network will be the same. Just that the routing will be different. Yes, yeah. The the number of OD trips mm -hmm. between the scenarios does not change. Okay. Um, it's basically all about routing okay. between those OD pairs. And then I have another question. You said a 2040 scenario. We were looking at what happened in you know, 2016, but on like say a 20, we'd want it on the base year network, not on the 2040 network. Did you run this on 2040 or the base year? We we ran these all on a future year network. Why didn't you? Oh, okay. Because yeah, you know, let me just put it this way: for I'm I'm imagining in my mind if we want to know if we know a big storm is coming and we anticipate that I-10 is going to shut down, we want to know it in today's network, not 2040's network. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure, sure. So I guess there's two parts to that. Um, yes, that does make sense. Um, you know, the base year, we, for the shift model, there are only two um, scenario years or two model Bottle years, leaders. the existing and then the 2040. Yeah. Um, so, you know, 2040 could be your, your worst case scenario in terms of land use, but it does also include those E plus C projects. Right, um, right. Now, I've got a question, um, Liza, since you're talking about the 2040 and you put your E plus C in, is this, um, and I may have missed, I may have so not heard you say it earlier. You know, our base year is what, 2010? What's our base? No, I, the base year I think is 2014. Okay. So 
our E plus C, uh, remind me what the E plus C limits are. What are, what are the term? What's the timing on that? Because it, we, you know, different different modeling styles do it differently. So ours is when we're using a master model, we put the years out there to turn them on and off at different times. So we put yes. year of implementation. Um, so do you have year of implementation for the projects? We do not because the scope was only to develop a f one future year. Mm -hmm. um, the scripts do not account for you know, sele a selection by year. Okay. Yeah. I think the projects may in their attribute, you know, in the attribute table may have a, an associated let year, mm -hmm. but the functionality okay. currently in the model does not account for that. Okay. Um, I I think I still have one more question about the um the builder and the existing. If we don't run the existing scenario, uh, how can we tell that if you shut down ten twenty, it's not gonna work for the existing year? And maybe just um, causing a problem for the future year. But in fact. It's not working even right now. If we don't run the scenario, we don't know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we we can we can run a, a base year evaluation. Um, I guess that's just where um, I miscommunicated and didn't know what was desired for this scenario. Yeah. Because. Well, we already knew that in, in back in March when it actually shut it down, it, the traffic was uh, a mess. It's uh, causing a, a, a big problem. So that's just something we want to say that model is going to reflect this situation. Yeah, right. and I mean, I mean that's that's a scenario. I mean, it can easily be run whether it's the base year or the the future year. Um, you know, it, it's the the good thing about this model is the scenario manager is very interactive. So you can create a scenario and go in and pick. You know, even if you wanted to get even more creative, you could go in and run a scenario with the existing roadway network, like the 2015 roadway network of the 2040 land use. Um, with this project, or you know, you can kind of mix and match what highway system and land use and projects you use. Um, so, does that mean the existing scenario is not going to be provided? But if we like, we can run it by ourselves. Is that is that what you mean? Well, okay, the existing scenario or the 2014 model was not run with these closures to date. Oh, okay, um, so you ran the closures on the 2040 model. We Correct. Okay, okay. Okay. So there was some miscommunication there. I apologize. I, I, I didn't, I guess I didn't know enough to, to make that clear. Yeah, but we were looking at... Um, what's happening with our current network. But it sounds like you can still use the 2040 version as a training tool, and it might be informative, but if we want to run this other scenario, we can use this training session to figure right. out how to do that. Right. Yes. Laura, and um, I, I'd be happy to, to help okay. whoever is going to be doing that through the process. Okay. Now, Laura, this is Virginia again. Sorry, Eliza. Um, mm -hmm. The guys in my <clears throat> the guys in my office, if they can hear me, will start laughing at me because the one thing that I preach to all my people when we when we start talking about modeling results and modeling output is that the model is not the answer. The model is a tool to get to the answer. So while yes, <clears throat> we want to see the results for 2016 to compare it to. 
you take the 2040 results or whatever the few, whatever the scenario is that you run and you use that to trend everything back because one of the things that we know that if we run let's just say we rarely do you have a base year model that is the current year because you're usually looking for decennial data and those types of things but what we found is if you run a current year model the first thing your administrators are going to do is pull traffic counts and go well these don't match so your model must be wrong <laughs> and so one of the one of the strategies in reiterating with your administration is that this is a tool so you go out and you do the future whatever the future scenario year is you get the trending out of that and then you back into it okay so that that gives you a little bit of and I hope I'm not saying anything incorrect or improper since I am a PE but you know we are we <laughs> <laughs> just the way you play the game sometimes. Yeah. But that way it does take into account, especially if you've been able to kick kick in your incremental improvements, but it allows you to show trending and then you back it in because you, oftentimes your administrators are going to say, and what, part of it has to do with also validity and credibility of your model. If they can't make it match to a current year number, thinking that, that and a lot of people think that the travel demand models should match accounts that are out there today or tomorrow even though they'll be different and if they don't match then it's wrong and yeah Virgin uh, Virginia that, that was that that was very well said I thought uh, that, that I mean I didn't mean to take day, your to steal your thunder lies. <laughs> but no, I, I, this, I have fought that battle this, before this. and I've had to explain so that's the one I want to let, let you know this, this is meant to be a tool, as you said, to to develop differences between, you know, one traffic, you know, one traffic situation and another traffic situation. Mm -hmm. I, I I went back to look at the scope, and and you know, we we did not mention the year in any any of this, and and so both uh, Bruce and I overlooked that. We just uh, didn't think about that. So sorry about that. Uh, well, no, I mean, I would imagine that if we ran the base year and the run of 2040, the truth about what would happen in 2016, 17, 18, or 19 is somewhere in the middle, so. Well, but the thing with the, I always find the, you know, the using the 2040 network, for most states, they're probably not a whole bunch of, there's no new interstate quarters being built. Most is going to be an urban principal arterial or something of that nature. So for this scenario, Laura, you're probably – I don't think Louisiana's got plans to four-lane I-10 across the state. It's already – I mean, yeah, each other, direction, eight lanes. The other, eight eight lane. the other thing lane. that uh, you might keep in mind <laughs> – <laughs> so, I mean, This I'm is not really a time-of-day model, so it, it's, it's less dependent on congestion than it is on, on travel time and those kind of uh, factors. Mm -hmm. uh, so – so uh, you know, uh, I, I think using 2040, you're you're not really going to get a wrong answer from okay. it, uh, in, in my opinion. Well, as long as I understand what I'm looking at, that's all that really matters. I just wanted to clarify what I was about to see. So, um, in, in, in a way, Laura, you're almost safer having to be 2040 because since the base year is 2014, you might get in, in into that situation that Virginia was talking about and say, well, look. Uh, uh, you know the traffic out there today is 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 twenty five thousand, and you're showing it being uh, twenty thousand. You know, so that's wrong. Yeah, I guess future, I guess bottom. I was gonna say I guess bottom line is to use this tool in relative terms yes, to apply yes. to existing. Yeah. Counts. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I just wanted to understand what I was seeing, and um, you can please proceed with your explanation. I understand now, so thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate I appreciate you bringing this stuff up because, you know, I want I want really want this to be useful for you guys, and um, you know, I feel that it is. So, um, keep asking questions. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> um. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so the models um, are run, um, you know, using the scenario manager, and then of course results are summarized. Um,
Now, there's a lot on this slide. Um, I just put it all on here really for documentation purposes. Um, this is basically the model updates that we, we specifically made for scenario 3A, 3B, and 3C, where 3C is just a combination of, of the two. Um, and really, there's only, only a couple of, of components that were updated. The first is, like I said earlier, those project IDs in the highway network and the project list that need to be entered. And so um, you'll see um, it, we had to actually enter in three records in the project list for 3A. Um, and the reason for this is because the area type changes as you progress through um, the project corridor. So um, you'll see, you know, scenario 3A1 is area type 3, functional class 1, and lane 0 because it's part of the closure. Um, whereas scenario 3A2 is area type 1, functional class lanes 1, lane 0. So anywhere where one of those three attribute combination changes, then you'll have to have a separate um, project ID identified. So um, for maybe let me show you what that looks like to give you an actual example. Oh, that's not what I want, sorry. So we've, we've developed a, a scenario list for every single scenario that we used. Um, and that's all based on the E plus C project list. But for scenario 3A, um, at the very bot, can you all see the TransCAD screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So at the very bottom, we added these three records. Um, and the, the first column is the project ID number, um, where, you know, ideally we'd just like scenario 3A. That would be great. It would be, you know, whatever the area type is, functional class 1, which is for interstate, and lanes is 0. But because the area type varies along the corridor, we have to have a record for each of the area type definitions. And then this project ID is entered in on those links in the highway network. And basically what, what the script does is it joins this table to the master network and selects where there's common IDs and exports out the existing network with the corresponding projects that match up um, to be the scenario network. So you can actually have all scenarios coded in to the master network at one time, but depending on your project list, it will only select to extract those projects that you have in your project list. Did I lose everyone on that? No, I, I, I mean, I got, one of the things, Daniel, I saw that you called in. Did you have any questions on any of this? Because I know you actually do a lot of this work with TransCAD. Has it all been presented to you in a way that makes sense? or? I, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, I think I understand that uh, I, I probably won't have any real questions until I actually get a chance to run it. Yeah. Okay. Right. But, hmm, okay. 
I'm just now wants me wants me. Uh, now I'm thinking which but the actually run the model. The the reason the reason I say that is is that there there's several different ways that you can structure a transcad model to actually work, and most of our models are not structured quite like this. Um, so I'll have to sit down and run it and get a feel for it, uh, and then I'll if I have any questions uh, at that time I'll I'll certainly ask. Okay. Yes. Please do. And um, so back to this PowerPoint real quickly. Um, so besides coding in the project IDs and the highway network and the project list, um, for this scenario, we also added some centroid connectors to allow for proper connectivity to the highway system. And these, this bullet kind of spells out, you know, the link IDs that were added between which zone and which roadway, um, so that you know exactly what was done um, as far as geographic edits. And then scenario B, we did the same thing. Um, we did not add any century, need to add any century connectors for scenario B but we did need to split a link to match the defined project limits. Now, um, Sue Han, who assisted in this coding process, took screenshots of basically every, every step <laughs> of the model that, that he did. Um, like, for example, if you see this PDF, the first image shows the project IDs added for scenario 3A. The second image shows those project IDs added for scenario 3B. And then the third shows the project added for scenario 3C, which are basically A, the combination of A and B. And then it goes on to show the geographic edits. You know, he had to split a link using the network editing tools um, and then identifying project links and coding in. I guess this is hard to see. Um, let's see if I can move this. But identifying links and coding in the project ID in the highway network, the master network, um, specifically the project underscore ID one field. And after doing several of those, he also has print screens for adding century connectors um, and copying the attribute values. Um, and then he has print screens for the model interface and running the model. So, you know, this one shows um, the interface when you first load the TransCAD add-in for the shift model. And then this next one shows creating or adding a new scenario um, where, you know, the first, he always ran a no build and then um, the scenario A3, 3A, 3B, and 3C. And then it just goes through each step of adding a scenario, defining, you know, the appropriate master network, the appropriate project list, um, if any turn restrictions or socioeconomic changes need to be made. And one other feature that I think you guys will find very beneficial is the select link um, feature where you have um, a text file um, with the extension .qry where you can identify those links um, to perform select link analysis. And we did that for each of these scenario runs. Um, it's asking you to verify settings, and then that's it. So these 
different screens. Um, you know, this scenario only has, I think, 35 print screens. Some of the more complicated ones have double or triple that. So they can be a little bit tedious, but we kind of had the feeling that more could be better if for those who wanted that level of detail. Um, but I, I really think this model is relatively simplistic. So once you get the hang of how to do it once or twice, um, you know, it, 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 it will be straightforward after you're able to do it a couple times. Okay, any questions on this before I proceed to some of the results? Yeah, I have, I have one question. Sure. Uh, normally when I create a new Centroid connector, connector in our models, uh, I will take an existing one and split it, and that automatically clones mm -hmm. all of the values from one to the other. Will that work in this one yes. as well? Um, yes, that should work. So. Let me tell you two things that may help you real quick. So um, let me make these connectors active. Um, close this down. So when you use your map editing toolbox um, and split a link, one thing I always do, and sorry if I'm repeating something you already do, but is check the configure settings. And if you click that icon and then the update button, you can verify all the attributes that what will happen with the attributes if you split a link. So right now you can see that if we split this, these li this link, it's going to copy attributes you know, to both links that are split, um, except for all these ones that are blank, so, which actually is OK for this, because this runs is populated by the model script. So that is OK. Um, so your method, yes, will work, and it will just copy all the attributes. One right, other way, you. yeah, if you want, if you want to, if you create a new line, um, you can use this feature called Edit Line Attributes. And if you click on one link, and then click on an adjacent link or another centroid connector, you can basically right click and copy values and it copies the entire set of values from one link to another. So that's just another way of doing the same thing. Oop. Okay. Any other questions? I'm just curious, how long does it take you to do this work, like this run? How long did it take? Are you talking like three hours, three days? No, yeah, it's, um, I think the entire model takes an hour. It's okay. pretty quickly, or pretty quick um, run time. Yeah. Liza, what are the specs on the machine that you're running? I don't need you to give it to me now, but um, that's something that is always interesting to us is uh, when we estimate the run times to know what the specs on the machines are because um, different machines re, you know, act differently. Oh, so you're saying right. it, it doesn't take you an hour to enter all this information, but it takes an hour for the machine to calculate it. Correct. It, from the time you click run run all in the interface, it will take about an hour to run. And um, then did it take yeah, you the, 10 minutes to enter the information? Um, no, it does take longer. Um, you know, that, that's 
more of where the effort comes in is making sure that you've identified, you know, the project termini and specifications in the model, um, updated the attributes, val did do some validation. Um, and you may have to run it a couple times if you run and notice, notice you know, some connectivity issue. Um, so it's probably about a day of of effort for for probably for all three of for scenario three, including you know running a well maybe even more because you're running a no build scenario three a scenario three b and scenario three c. Um, okay. And can you see the specs? Does this print screen show up on the computer where we've got um, you know, 64-bit, um, 16 gigabyte of RAM, Windows 7, Okay, any other questions? We probably will have a question when we run it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes, and I'll provide, I mean, of course, you know, I think you already have a model package, but if not, I can get that to you along with this presentation and then all the print screens that we've taken. Mm -hmm. Well, Liza, that led me to another question is maybe what we'll do is we go through this scenario, I share all the results with everybody, and then um, maybe we, we come back and say, okay, everybody within a week try to run it and get your thoughts on trying to duplicate what you know, was done for this one. Yeah. Um, and then once that's done, then it'll be a lot easier to finish up the other, the other ones from a training perspective, I guess. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so I'll give you some high-level results of you know, what this scenario looks like. And um, basically what we have here are the total daily volumes on the, the project link as well as um, parallel facilities. Now the model does report auto and truck volumes separately, um, but this, this particular table just shows daily volumes. And to break this table down, uh, you can see if we look at just the first row, um, the no build has in 2040 has 60,000 vehicles on I-20, but scenario 3A, which is the closure of I-20, shows zero vehicles as intended. Um, and then you can see parallel facilities show an increase in volume. Um, U.S. So Highway 82. Say, link it? number. Does that mean that particular segment? So we I-20 for the entirety from state line to state line doesn't have zero. It's just that segment has zero. Correct. Yes. This is we just picked particular links, um, okay. like a screen line, basically. Um, okay. Okay. For to reflect parallel links to. I-20 or I-10. Um, you know, and so you can kind of tell, we, we just picked three links. Um, you know, there wasn't much increase on I-10. We actually found that a lot of people took, you know, more back roads, so to speak, or, or you know, lower level facilities um, to route around. But these three links only reflect about 45-ish, 50% of, you know, the, the total 60,000. Um, mm -hmm. So there's some dispersion. Right. And that, now that's my question is that um, if you've got a break on I-10, 
where you're, well, I'll take it back. You're breaking I-20. How far did your screen line go? Because on the network that you have, that 60,000, that 60,000 ADT has got to go somewhere. And it's obviously not going to the three links that are shown. So how far north did you extend your screen line? Because yeah, we it should have <laughs> might have picked up thirty and forty. Yeah, the difference is yeah. on thirty and forty in Arkansas. Correct. Yeah, we honestly we just picked um, the closest parallel facilities and didn't extend it um, all the way. So, you know, that's another thing where we could have re- could report, you know, whatever you want to define your screen line as. Um, mm-hmm. you know, because you can do it by selecting again, it. you know, it's one of those credibility things. Because if if they say that I tend to only going up two thousand vehicles a day, then you're losing. I mean, because I added them up, you're missing thirty three thousand vehicles, um, and they've got to go somewhere. All that to say, I've got a two o'clock phone call that I've got to drop off to take care of. So um, I like the idea of what y'all have done so far. Um, I like the idea of sending out to test, and then we'll we'll work on it. Because um, I assume you're not going to do the seismic scenario today. No, we were okay, just going to focus on this sure. one. Oh, I've got to do this other um, call, so I'm sorry. And it okay. looks interesting. Good luck, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Virginia. Um, yeah, so I, I guess what this table is intended to show is um, you know that the the scenario or the volumes are reflecting what we would anticipate. You know, with with closing I twenty, you would expect to see increases on parallel facilities. Um, same with I ten, um, and then additionally with with the closure of both of them. And then there's two other types of results that I wanted to just quickly share that we've put together um, and these are hard to see but plot size or just viewing them in TransCAD is definitely um, a, a better way to go. Um, what we did was look at bandwidth so the thicker the line the higher the volume and this is an example of the volume flows for the no build. So with, that's with I-20 and I-10 open to traffic. And the red dots or the red links are just showing those particular IDs from the previous table, um, just to give you a reference point. And then you can kind of see going from no build to build, there's a shift in traffic on I, from I-20 where the interstate has closed and um, you can see that, that traffic's going down um, State Highway 9 to bypass the, the, the closure part. And similarly on I-10 where there's a closure going from no build to the closure traffic shifts um, mainly to the south on, on State Highway 27. So, so do, the, these, do these maps utilize this thing you called a screen line? So the maps, um, um, can be used to help identify a screen line that you may want to summarize results on. Basically a screen line or user defined links um, that you can tally the volumes on um, and make comparisons. So I would say yes, this map would be helpful in defining those screen lines. But the results of this map, the results on this map are not affected or impacted or they don't there's no screen line on this map. Correct. Yeah, this is just a picture, um, you know, a picture representation of how volumes are shifted 
okay. um, to parallel facilities. Okay, thanks. And then this is this is scenario 3C with both I20 and I10 closed. Um, you can kind of you, you can just see the diversion to the south of I20, the diversion to the south of I10. Um, you know, I I I don't know other also U.S. Highway 84 um, volume increase there as well. So I, I guess the point is these bandwidth maps are um, very useful in showing volume shifts, but getting in um, to the screen line analysis is also very useful because it may not show quite the magnitude. Um, you know, once you put numbers to things, it really um, tells the story. Okay, and the the last um, picture type result is the select link analysis that we did, and this is a comparison between the no build or existing conditions for 2040, as well as um, compared to scenario 3A, which is the I-20 closure, and. It's, there's a lot on here. I know it can be difficult to read, but in the no build, um, you can see, so this is closure of I-20. So on I-10, the patterns look about the same, but you can see when I-20 is closed, there's more traffic um, getting on I-10 via, I'm not sure what corridor this is, but you know, between I-20 and I-10. Then on US-82, you can see it is much um, more heavily traveled in when I-20 is closed. And then on I-20 itself in the no-build, there's a lot of traffic crossing, you know, the project location and zero traffic with it closed. So the point of this is I just wanted to let you be aware of the select link analysis that can be um, conducted with the shift model or within the shift model. Basically it tells you where traffic is coming from and where is it, where it is going to. And you can do a kind of a before and after um, maps to show, paint the picture of how traffic is being diverted. Um, one of the questions that Bruce had in the agenda was compatibility with other programs. I touched on this previously, but um, I did want to mention again that TransCAD um, 7 requires an update to all geographic files and this model was not developed um, or was developed prior to TransCAD 7 being released. So it's not forwards compatible. Um, it needs to be run in TransCAD 6. Um, the, the inputs and outputs can be exported to geographic files. So you can um, utilize shape files of the model results for mapping or further analysis outside of TransCAD. And all databases can be um, exported as DBF files, which are compatible with Excel and Access. And of course, any maps can be saved as or printed um, as PDFs or even JPEGs for reporting purposes. And that's all that I had today. Um, I know I went through that very quickly, but as you guys start to play with these scenarios and test them on your own, don't hesitate to um, reach out to us. Well, my